it's still blurred it's not clearing up i i switched off and switched on it's still blurred it's clear now good you stand here <laughs> thanks i know you can go ahead <laughs> Oh, that's okay. No? I'm in the middle. Oh, it went back to its original. Let it be. No. It's okay. Yeah. Hmm. Put it closer. Hey, that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. Before the break, we were looking at sense of omission, sense of commission, and we also looked at how sometimes we can be doing good things and feeling good about ourselves, but are we in the will of God? Because God may have wanted us to do something else. So it is uh, important for us to first consult with the Lord and do accordingly. So it's not just enough to do good things. Are we doing good things which are in line with his will? Uh, because otherwise it becomes a sin anyway. Um, also motives also. You know, I may be doing all the good things that are asked of me, but am I doing them with the correct motive or not? Um, if I'm doing something just because of the popularity I can get out of it, or some person that I can get out of it, if the motive is wrong, then again that becomes sin. So I may be doing good things, but am I doing those good things in the will of God? And also, are my motives correct? in doing that good deed. All of these things uh, would count uh, because if we are not following that, then it would automatically become a sin. So we observe that sin always contradicts what God wants, what God says. And, um, you know, uh, this, this portion is in your notes. You know, it says sin gives a different answer to the question, what is right? So God says something is right. And then, uh, you know, sin will say, no, 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 the opposite is right. So there's always a contradiction between what sin says and what God says. And the example given in your notes is, you know, uh, from the Genesis story. Uh, so you would have Genesis 2.17, um, where it says, if someone can read out Genesis 2.17, And then Genesis 3, 5, what does uh, Satan say? So God says, if you, you know, you must not eat first of all, but if you eat of it, you will die. And uh, you have Satan saying the exact opposite. He says, no, in fact, if you eat of it, something good will happen. He says, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil and all of that. So sin usually contradicts um, you know, God on what he says. God says something and sin says you know, something else. Uh, in the same way, uh, sin also gives a different answer to the question, uh, what is true? And uh, you know, just to use the same example, Genesis 2.17, the truth was that God said, when you eat, you will die. And uh, so in Genesis 3.4, Satan says, you will not certainly die. And we see that after they eat the fruit, they don't drop down dead. So maybe they initially thought, oh, OK, you know, God was lying when he said that. It was not actually true. You know, so sin will bring these uh, thoughts into our mind that what god is saying is not 100% true maybe 99% true but this is 1% catch you know is what sin says on the other hand god says that he is the truth okay so uh, whatever he says is 100% correct so there's always this contradiction between uh, sin which tries to take you away from what god is saying and it's trying to take you away from uh, what is what God has established as being the truth and what God has established as being correct. Uh, so the third thing it says in your notes, sin gives a different answer to the question, who am I? And I think this is again something which we touched upon in one of our previous classes. We saw how 
in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, God very clearly says, we, we will make mankind in our likeness. And it goes on to say in verse 27, in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. So they were already like God. And yet uh, you have Satan coming and saying to them, you know, if you do this thing which God is telling you should not, then you will become like God. The point is they were already like God. The only thing that God has held back from mankind is that we are not divine. There's only one divine uh, you know, entity and that is God. Nobody else is God. He alone is God. So we are not divine. But apart from that, God has given us what he has. We are made in his image. So, um, and also it is a lie when Satan says, you know, to um, Adam and Eve, because then you will have knowledge of good and evil. Uh, the thing is that uh, Adam already had been given a lot of wisdom. So uh, we see that, right, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, where, um, you know, God brings all the animals to Adam and he asks him to name them. And Adam has the required wisdom. He has the required knowledge to be able to come up with the correct names for all of the creatures. So they already had wisdom. The only thing they did not have is that um, this knowledge, this independent knowledge of good and evil. God would say, you know, do this. They would do that. God would say, you know, uh, uh, this is right for you on this particular day. They would just simply go ahead and do what God is saying is right for them. They were not independently thinking for themselves and saying, ah, I think this may be right and this may be wrong. They were completely dependent on him, covered by him, protected by him. But now what Satan was doing is, why don't you sin? Because if you sin, you'll come out from that protection and then you will have to decide for yourself, oh, what is right, what is wrong. You'll have to figure out how to overcome the sin which is controlling you. You will have to do everything on your own and you will no longer be under that safe covering. So he brings them out into uh, the open, outside the covering of God. And then now they have good and evil in their hands, knowledge of good and evil, and they are helpless to obey what is good completely helpless because now they are disconnected from him. So in fact, by no, having this knowledge of good and evil, they lost the connectivity that they had with God. And they discovered that on their own, they cannot do what is good, even though they now have full knowledge. So it's a really, very sad uh, thing, you know, the way that things turned out. So what did God say about who they are? You know, uh, it says right in your notes, it, the wrong answer is given by sin to the question, who am I? So in God, you are made in his image, in his likeness, he has imparted his own wisdom to you. And as long as you are come dependent on him, completely trusting him and just listening to what he is saying, you will be able to bear fruit in all areas of your life. On the other hand, the connection between him and you is weak and you're not really abiding in him, but doing your own thing. Then you will not be able to bear much fruit, even though you have the knowledge of good and evil. It's really not going to help you in, in doing what is good and, and producing the fruit. On your own, you cannot bear fruit in your office work. You cannot bear fruit in your family relationships. You cannot bear fruit. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the responsibilities which you have taken up in society, you'll simply not be able to bear fruit in all of those areas of life where God actually wanted you to flourish. So it's so important to, be, uh, to have that attitude of submission where we say, okay, Lord, what you are asking me to do, I'll just do that. You know, so that, that would take a humbling, it would, it would take a, a, a level of trust, you know, which God expects of us. So, which is why this is other word also used in the New Testament. Um, you know, uh, hamartia was the first word that we looked at, which is talking about missing the mark. And there's this other word, it's the word called anomia, A-N-O-M-I-A. And um, I don't know, in different translations, it's it's translated in our English Bibles in, with a different word. The word iniquity is used in some Bibles. The word lawlessness is used in some Bibles. In some places, it's it's called wickedness. Basically, this word is saying that you are actively defying and rebelling against what God has commanded. So it's like a very active rebellion and active defiance 
against what God has required. And, um, you know, they, they use this example of what the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. God very clearly commanded that homosexuality is not acceptable to him. And they were openly going against what they knew to be correct. So they were openly defying what God has you know, established. And that is the word which is used over there, you know, that word anomia, because when Peter talks about it, that's the word that he uses. If someone can actually read out 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. That word, uh, that you know, that phrase over there, lawless deeds in our English Bible, that actually is your word anomia. It's a direct defiance. The law said something, God's law said something, and they were going actively against that law and defying it, rebelling against it and saying, no, we know what your law is, but we don't care. We are going to do what we want to do. So that was basically what the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. And so it talks about Lot, uh, who is a righteous man. And he is tormented in his righteous heart to see what they are doing, how they are actively going against what God has commanded. Okay, So um, we see that word uh, used in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, if someone can read out 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Okay, so sin is basically anomia. So it's not just that, oh, you made a mistake. No, it is you actively defying and saying, I know what your law is, but I choose not to do it. So you're, you're rebelling against what God has established. So all sin, whether it's something as simple as telling a lie, or whether it it, it, no, it 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 involves much more serious things like actually going and stabbing someone and murdering them, whatever the sin may be, you know, in our human eyes, whether we regard it as a big sin or a small sin, the point is that you chose actively to defy what God had established as being correct, what God has has given to us as a law. We are directly breaking that, and uh, when we do that, it's not just that we are disobeying what he has said, we are literally going against what he is as a person in his nature. He is good, he is righteous, he is holy. And it's like as if we are mocking who he is and saying, I know who you are, I know what you stand for, but I don't care. So it's like as if you're literally mocking him. So you see, it's not just about you know uh, a person giving a set of rules and you're breaking the rules, but you have nothing against the person. It's not that. Here, God's rules and God's, God, his very person, are connected. Out of his nature, out of who he is, he established those laws. So you're not just defying the rules. You're literally defying him, his very nature, and saying, I know what holiness is, and I choose to mock it. It's like a very shocking thing to do where you're literally going against his very personhood. And that is why sin is so serious. You can't just say, ah, you know, it's my weakness and that is why I'm doing it. No, it's like you literally saying, I know that you are holy, but I, you know, I, I'm laughing at your holiness. I couldn't care less. That's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very a direct defiance. And that's the word anomia. It's a very strong word that is used, you know, to express that kind of attitude. And what does it say about anomia, especially now in our last days? This is what it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. If someone could read out Matthew 24, verse 12. And because lawlessness will around the love of many will grow cold. <laughs> I am not happy with that. Uh, translation at all you know it says in the niv because of the increase of wickedness okay the word anomia because of the increase of anomia the love of most will grow cold the increase in anomia this increase you know 
what we do we can do we are our own owner we are our own people so we can do whatever we wish to do this whole attitude of anomia that is existing especially now in our current you know days you know where people say you know i am my own person i get to decide what i want to do this is my body this is my life and so this whole uh, attitude of anomia which even creeps into us believers what does it lead to it causes your love to grow cold you don't really care about him you don't care about his holiness you know it's all about anomia it's me doing what i want to do i know what is right but i choose to openly defy that so this attitude of anomia can be extremely dangerous it can lead to uh, you know a love for god growing cold if we you know entertain it and we don't keep it in check if we don't you know um, work actively against it and you know to to get rid of that attitude in our hearts um so um if we can also maybe read matthew chapter 23 verse 28 matthew 23 28 okay so uh, so again over here it's talking about how they are full of hypocrisy and anomia so the people the pharisees were respected as a godly bunch of people that's the respect which they had earned because of all the outward things that they were doing but on the inside there was a lot of anomia going on where they really did not want to uh, love the lord or submit to his word and because of that there was hypocrisy happening on the inside they they were following one thing feeling one thing longing for one thing but on the outward they were pretending to be something else so they were you know so they they were hiding the anomia inside them and that you know god says um you know he compares that's why he compares them to a grave says the grave looks so nice on the outside but on the inside oh my it's like you know it's smelling it's stinky so that's what basically what god says um so maybe we can just look at one more scripture titus chapter 2 verse 14 if someone could read out titus 2 14 Okay, so the good news, after having talked about all the terrible, horrible things, the good news over here is that there is one person who can actually redeem us, set us free from this anomia. It's what it says over here. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all anomia, okay, from all wickedness, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. No, the same way you have, uh, you know, it says in Matthew twenty-four, right? The, that this uh, anomia is increasing in the world. People are, you know, wanting to do their own thing. But over here, God has the power. Jesus Christ has the as the ability to create for Himself and purify for Himself a people who are not eager for that. They are in fact eager to do what is good. So He says, uh, you know, it says over here in the Scripture that Jesus Christ has actually got the power to redeem us. from all anomia so you know even when we examine ourselves and we see this attitude in our hearts to do what i want to do rather than what you are telling me to do when we see that we can go to him humbly and say yes lord i can see this attitude even in myself now lord you said in your scripture that you can redeem me set me free from this attitude so oh lord would you please do that for me you know you can ask him for that and he will purify himself i uh, you know uh, such people and he will make them into people who are eager actually enthusiastic about doing what is good about doing what he is asking so it's not something that we can do in our own strength but one very sensible step that we can take is to frankly admit that we are not able to do it and go to him and ask him for his help and when we go to him he helps us you know he enables us uh, so what are some of the consequences of sin that we see 
there are natural consequences. We'll just look at that first. And then we will look at the spiritual consequences of sin. At a natural level, you know, you basically get separated from God. And so God cannot really, you know, um, help you. He cannot really answer your prayers. So we see all of that. Um, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. If someone can read out Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. So over here in Isaiah, you know, uh, the prophet is speaking to the people and he says, it's, and God, you know, the, the your prayers are not getting answered. And it's not because God's ear has become dull and he can't hear anymore. It's because you people have chosen to separate yourself from him. So you're no longer under his covering. So which is why he is unable to bless you. So, so he says, your iniquities have separated you from your God. So he is still their God, but they are separated from their God. Their iniquities, their sins have separated them from their God. And because of their sins, it says he has hidden his face from you and he will not hear. So there's this thing which happens where um, God still loves you. God still cares about you. But God has set um, eternal rules in place which he will not break just for your sake. These are eternal rules that he has placed. So basically one you know rule that you can say, if you want to call it a rule, it's just more like a principle. When you're under his covering, he's able to do for you all that he you know has promised. But when you willfully step, you know, choose to step out of that covering, then you're basically on your own. You have you're now under the authority of the ruler of the air, and he can do what he wants, and it, it'll be a huge mess. So um, it's safer to be under that covering so that God can do for you what you know he has what he desires to do. So um, the second thing is also similar. Um, you know, so. These are all, I think, in your in your notes, I, if I remember. Yeah, they are in your notes. So the separation from God and then uh, uh, sin keeps away the blessings of God. You know, very similar to what we already said. Uh, but we look at the scripture which is mentioned in your notes. Uh, that would be Jeremiah 5, verses 24 and 25. Someone can read out Jeremiah 5, 24 and 25. Let us now fear the Lord our God, who keeps saying both the former and the latter in him. He receives, he reserves for us the appointed days of the other. When iniquities, when iniquities have come to the same and your sins have withered good from you. So they are not choosing to fear and honor and obey the God who gives them the autumn and the spring rain. So he's the one who makes the rain come at the correct time so that the cro crops will grow. He's the one who makes sure that when at harvest time, you know, their crops are all ripe and available for them to eat and for them to sell and for them to live. So God is the one who takes care of those things. But what have these people done? It says, your wrongdoings have kept all of this away. So you, it's, your, it's your sinfulness which has kept the rain away. The rain would have come. God would have taken care of those details. But now you are under the control of the ruler of the air. You have chosen to place yourself over there. And because of that, the rains have not come. You have, and it says over there in the last portion, your sins have deprived you of good. God meant good for you. He wanted good for you. But your sins have deprived you of that good. Okay, so... Um, so sin separates us from God and keeps us away from his blessings. And then, of course, we have a lot of spiritual consequences of sin. Um, the first, of course, we know, you know, uh, sin is the one which makes us a slave. And um, Jesus, in fact, talks about that. Uh, if someone could read out John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, 
I say to you, whoever commits anything is made. So the wording that Jesus uses over there, he says, most assuredly. In some translations, it will say, truly, truly. In other places, it will say, very truly. So whenever Jesus uses that phrase, he's saying, pay attention to what I'm writing over here, because this is not just a nice sentence that I'm saying. This is absolute truth. OK, so whenever, wherever you see that most assuredly, or truly, truly, or very truly, he is saying, take this seriously. It's actually. 100% true, even though it may sound like as if it's not true, it is 100% true. So kindly accept it and pay attention to what I am saying over here. And what is he saying over here? He's saying everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Whether you like it or not, it is like this beast. It will come and take over. It's ready to crow. It is crouching over there, waiting to pounce. And it will take over. It will control. It will not let go. It's a serious thing. So don't approach sin like as if, oh, it's a one-time mistake that I'm making. No, that one-time mistake is actually like a beast. It is crouching. It is waiting to pounce. And once it has its claws inside you, it's not very easy to lay for, you know, to get rid of that. So uh, it would have to be, you know, it would take, you have to take a divine act of the Holy Spirit for you to be set free from that thing which has taken control. So there are very, very serious issues involved. So Jesus is saying, Understand the seriousness of this. When you commit a sin, it's not just some mistake that you're making. You are actually placing yourself as a slave under a very dangerous slave master. You know, so that's the point that he is making over here to these people who are calling themselves descendants of Abraham. So Jesus is saying, just because you're a descendant of Abraham doesn't you know, protect you and shield you from these realities. You are actually placing yourself voluntarily as a slave under a very, very cruel slave master sin, which, you know, which will not let you go easily. So um, the first spiritual consequence is that becomes, we become slaves of sin. The second thing is that we open up our life to demonic interference. So because we are no longer under his safe covering, we are now exposed to danger. So this is the verse that we were looking at, you know, about the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Um, so if someone could read out that, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you follow the way of the world, the offer of the Lord. So when we sin, we open ourselves up to the work of this ruler of the air. So he is now actively at work in all those who are disobedient. So it's rather foolish for children who are uh, children of God, for people who belong to the royal family, for them to very, very foolishly go and place themselves under some, some evil per person like this, some evil force like this, who is... Who, 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 when you, when you, when you give that opening, he begins to work in your life. It says over here, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So even people of God, when they choose to disobey, they are voluntarily exposing themselves to the work of this evil force of the air. Uh, or rather, you know, it's it's the the wording actually is talking about Satan and all of his forces. We are placing ourselves under his. Uh, control. So we are exposing ourselves to, uh, you know, demonic interference. And of course, the ultimate penalty of uh, sin we know, right, is death. Um, uh, yeah, if we, you know, Romans six twenty three, a very very popular verse. If someone could read out Romans six twenty three. Okay, so the wording used over here is very interesting. It says, the wages of sin is death. What is the word wages? That's basically your salary. It's what you get paid. You know, you put in your work. You, you work sincerely for one month. At the end of one month, your boss gives you your salary. He gives you your wages. So if you have been serving sin, if sin is your boss, so if sin is your master, then 
after you have served sin and done all the sinful things and defied God and you know uh, acted in rebellion against Him, what is the wages? What is the salary that you are receiving from your master's sin? He basically gives you death, and death is given to you at three levels in three different ways. So we basically have the inward spiritual death, you know, which had happened to Adam and Eve. God told them you will die. And then Satan comes along and says, no, 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 you will not die. So who is the one who is the master of truth? It's the Lord, the one who said you will die. And so actually, whether they realized it or not, they did die. So the first kind of death which was experienced was the inner spiritual death which happened to them. Um, one verse that we can look at, um, you know, um, Ephesians 4, verse 18. Ephesians 4, 18. Okay, so uh, these are unbelievers. They have hardened their hearts against uh, what God wants. And that is because, because of that, their understanding has become darkened. And this is the final result. You see what has happened to them? They are separated from the life of God. So that is what happened to Adam and Eve originally. They were separated from the, from the source of life. So they only had spiritually, they had spiritual death inside their, you know, inside their human spirit. They were no longer connected to the wine. So the, 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 the life source of the living God was no longer flowing into their spirit. Their human spirit became a spiritually dead spirit. So the first kind of death which a person experiences due to sinfulness is the, uh, is the deadness inside, the spiritual death which happens to you, to you who, you who are a spiritual being. The second thing, of course, you know, it takes many years for it to happen, but that also will definitely happen, the second kind of death, which is your physical death. And no one can deny that. You know, everyone has to accept the fact that there is such a thing as physical death. And um, Hebrews 9.27 is one verse which talks about that. Hebrews 9.27. Yeah, so this uh, no one can escape from this. All of us are destined to die. Okay, so... Uh, the spiritual death which happens to your human spirit inside. Second, there's an actual physical death which happens to your body as well. Um, and um, then there is a third thing. This is called the second death in your uh, book of Revelation. Okay, so um, what exactly is the second death? Where you are eternally cut off from God's presence. Human beings, when they were created in the image of God, they were meant to be dependent on God and He would be their source of life and He would be the source of everything that they're supposed to be. And so when the human being who has been created in God's image is completely cut off from the source, what a horrible existence that must be. Of course, you know, uh, hell is painful. Of course, when it says lake of fire, fire is painful. All of those facts are there. But literally what you were made to be, you were, you were literally made in the image of God and you're cut off from your creator, I think it destroys a large part of, part of who you are. And that must be a deep level of loneliness, which, which is unbearable. You see people who know on this earth today who are busy cursing God and saying, ha, what kind of a God is he? And you know, they, they're saying all of that. But every day, without their realizing, they're enjoying his mercy and grace on so many levels, whether they realize it or not. It's not just that they have sun, you know, uh, sun in the sky to keep them warm. Uh, it's not that they have rains at the right time. Yes, God is taking care of those details. But even at the level of emotions and all of that, there is some level of connectivity still. This God is still there. He's still giving them a chance to turn around. So they, so they, so they're still experiencing some level of His presence. Once He's completely, utterly removed of that connection, is completely broken then they would literally feel what demons feel. I mean, it's like, um, it's a very terrible thing. 
so that will that is why it's that's called the second death it's that's the, that's the term that is used in revelation for it this is this eternal you know eternal cutting off from god's presence which takes place at that time uh, we'll just look at the matthew uh, verse where you know jesus is speaking uh, matthew chapter 25 verse 41 if someone could read out matthew 25 41 so the hell and this lake of fire which you know which is mentioned in the revelation uh, in revelation that was originally created for prepared for uh, the devil and his fallen angels it was never meant to be the place where people created in the image of god should go that was just not his intention but because these people you know have chosen uh, not to place themselves under his covering he says to them depart from me you who are cursed so now god's curse rests upon them and they are banished and cut off from him forever and ever it's um, the most horrible thing that can happen to someone created in the image of god where they are no longer connected in any way to their life source uh, it's something that only they can describe only they can feel that uh, and thankfully we will never have to feel that you know so um, so which is why you know uh, we have this passion and this burden to reach out to as many people as possible and you know share with them what jesus christ has done so that they too can be connected to their creator uh, so that they will not have to undergo this really horrible thing that's awaiting them you know once that second death takes place so we see that de death operates at three levels you know uh, and that is the one of the consequences of sin now um, just to touch upon maybe a few things before we close we don't have much time left um, what about you know little children who are uh, who die in their infancy um, they have not yet grown to a stage where they can you know uh, decide for themselves oh this is right this is wrong and i choose to do what is right they have not reached that choice at uh, that age of choice making where they can consciously tell themselves uh, yes this is wrong and so i choose today to do what is right i choose to reject this wrong thing they have not yet reached that level of maturity to be able to do that um, the bible clearly recognizes that that that's such a thing you know that um, that at a very early age children will not be able to do this uh, so that's something that the bible acknowledges uh, so uh, let's look at deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 39 where you know this is uh, this concept very clearly comes out deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 39 We know the background to this particular verse, right? I mean, um, uh, the people, when God says, you know, I have something beautiful waiting for you, just go into that land and I will give it to you. You will be able to defeat all your enemies. I will give you victory. I will go before you. You know, so God is uh, promising something so beautiful out of the goodness of his heart. And what do they say? They say, ha, ah, he's taking us inside over there to kill us and not just kill us, to kill our innocent little children, you know, who don't know anything yet. And he, God wants to destroy them. So when God says, you know what? You people who have understood, who have seen my heart all these years, you know, I mean, uh, I mean all this time when you actually led them out of uh, Egypt, you have seen me providing for you. You have seen me, you know, taking care of you. Even when enemies came, you saw how I defended you. You watched all these things. So you kind of know who I am. And now you are opening your mouth and saying that I'm taking you over there to destroy you, not to bless you. And so God says, you're so worried about these little children, right? Who are not even old enough to make their own decision. You see, those little children are not in a position to decide and say, we will go into the promised land or we won't go. They're still too young to understand the difference between good and evil, um, uh, to be able to take a decision on their own those children the lord says you are saying that they are that i'm going to get them killed you know what they are the ones who will walk in and they are the ones who will conquer their giants 
they are the ones who will actually succeed what you're saying about their future will not even happen because i am indeed good but you people who have made this wrong accusation against me every one of you will die over here and it's the ones that you're so concerned about the little ones who do not know what is good and are, are unable to make a decision on their own they are the ones who will walk in and they will be blessed and they will conquer is what god says over here so god is aware of the fact that children uh, at a very young age are still not able to take a decision and say i now realize that this is good this is bad and today i choose to do good they have not yet reached that stage the so for different children it will be at a different time i suppose and god knows god who knows the hearts of every person will know when the child reaches that age of being able to take a decision to understand the concept of good and evil and actually take a decision and make a choice so at that point from that point onwards that child will be held accountable but before that age you know it generally believed uh, that um, children who are below that age will automatically just be covered by god and they would be taken to heaven uh, even though you know they have died without having said a salvation prayer or anything like that so um, that is that's the general uh, concept that we hold on to so just very briefly to look at what happens when we christians sin so you know when we christians sin what happens um now is this in your notes yeah i think this is actually in your notes uh, you know so um, we do not lose our legal standing before god we are not losing um, you know um, we are still forgiven by god uh, we are still clothed in the righteousness of jesus christ okay so that does not change which is why it says in romans 8:1 what does it say in romans 8:1 if someone could read out exactly there is no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus so uh, god will not condemn that person and say you know now you are destined for hell no because that person has now come under the covering of jesus christ and they are clothed in the righteousness of christ so the, they are not condemned um, they are uh, not you know um, now they don't automatically go to the side of the unbelievers in the same way they don't lose their salvation either because salvation is not based on your good deeds uh, you know it is in fact based on the free gift that god has extended to us um we see that in romans chapter 6 verse 23 how does it describe our salvation what does it say romans 6:23 it says the gracious gift of god is eternal life so when we sin uh, our legal standing of being accepted is not lost in the same way our salvation is also not lost because we have you know um um we the we have accepted it uh, as a free gift from god um also our sins have been forgiven uh even the in the, even the at the moment of salvation even the future sins which we 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 will be committing those also get forgiven why because of uh, you know verses like 1 corinthians 15:3 um maybe we can read 1 corinthians 15:3 so when jesus christ didn't just die long ago for the sins which you have committed up to the moment of salvation he has even died for the sins which you will be performing after your uh, you know salvation experience so all the sins have already been covered uh, they have already been paid for by jesus christ when he died on the cross so your sins also has stand forgiven but what happens is that your fellowship with him that gets cut off so that's basically the you know the the damage which takes place um first john chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 uh, what does it say if someone can read out first john mm. no first john first john chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 
Okay, so if a person is happily living in sin and they're saying, you know, I'm having fellowship with God, you know, he, uh, John is saying over here, you're basically lying to yourself. You may be under the impression that you're having fellowship with God, that you're abiding in him. But the plain truth is that if you're walking in darkness, if you're doing sinful deeds, your fellowship has been cut off. You are no longer in fellowship with him. What you are telling yourself is a big lie. Because so your sins continue to remain forgiven. Your legal standing you know, of being accepted by God, it remains. You have not lost your salvation. But that fellowship is cut. You are no longer in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And um, because of that, because you are no longer you know, uh, connected to the vine in the way God wants you to be, you will be unfruitful in every area of your life. Now we can have John chapter 15. John 15 verse 4. Mm. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Okay, so... Uh, this is one uh, very important aspect of our Christian life that is fully impacted. We stay a failure in every area of life, you know, without that connection with the life source, because Jesus Christ is our life source. Uh, and that is why in Romans chapter 6, that entire, you know, that entire chapter, we are asked to present our bodies as instruments of righteousness because now we are a, we are new, we're a new creation we can choose whether we want to set our minds on the things of the spirit or whether we want to set our minds on the things of the flesh if our if we are setting our minds on the things of the spirit we will offer our eyes for righteous acts we will offer our hands for righteous deeds so you, you, because we have set our mind and heart on godly things on the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will offer our body uh, to him as instruments of righteousness. And the danger is that if our mind is still set on the fleshly things, there's every chance that we will not be able to control ourselves and we'll end up giving our eyes, our heart, our hands, all of that to the works of evil instead. So we now have to make a conscious choice if we choose to give our, if we, if, we, if we choose to set our minds on the right party, we will give all of ourselves to the right party. It's as simple as that. So, um, uh, therefore, it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 19, uh, you know, he says, I'm using the example of everyday life in talking this way about slaves and all of that. So, he says, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity, he says, uh, now, instead, you know, offer your slaves as slaves to righteousness. So we'll conclude on this note where sin is still around. Sin has not died. We are the ones who died to sin in the sense we became a new creation and it can no longer control us the way it used to control us before. So now because we are free, it says you don't have to live like the other people. You can choose to give your body to him to do righteous things is what you know so we'll just close on that note and next class we will look at what jesus christ has done for us um, and uh, we'll also look at the uh, role of the holy spirit in our lives so we will look at that doctrine so you will observe that i'm not going in the same order in which your notes are given okay so um, when you finally have your midterm assessment it will be on the topics which we are covering it will not be in the order which is there in your uh, you know, in your notes. Uh, so let's just close with a word of prayer as there's no time left. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could learn today, O oh Lord. It is good for us to know that we are not under the control of sin. We have seen that sin is very dangerous. It's like a beast. It's waiting to, cr it's crouching to pounce upon us, to take control of us. But Lord, all that is now behind us we are now part of your family. We now actually have the freedom to set our minds on what we wish to set our minds on. So you help us, O oh Lord, to be uh, God-focused, to renew our minds with your word, 
so that it will not go on longing for uh, the things of the world, but it will start getting excited about the things of God. So you help us, O Lord, to renew our minds on a daily basis so that we will offer our bodies to you rather than to sin, uh, to do uh, good things which you, O Lord, uh, desire from us. So we pray, O Lord, that you would help us in all of this. We pray that all these doctrines will become actual realities in our, uh, in our everyday spiritual walk. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.